right, hello everyone, and welcome to the Gallery Nucleus Owl House Art Exhibition. Uh, first off, I want to say the cosplay in here is amazing. So if, if you are physically able and comfortable, can you guys stand up so we can see your awesome cosplay? <laughs> So it's like awesome to be able to actually like see it in person. Um, so we have an awesome panel for you guys today with a bunch of the lovely, lovely, amazing crew who works on the show. Uh, so hi, my name is Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Baza. Uh, I'm a production associate at Disney TV Animation. Uh, you might also know me from like internet stuff as Rebecca Rose or I covered cartoons and oh, thank you. I slipped all those people a five before they came in to cheer for me. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna introduce the rest of the panel here. So we have one of the individuals who is responsible for all the excitement, all the laughs, all the tears, <laughs> and of course, all the drama in the Owl House. We have our season three head writer, co-producer on the show, and also the inspiration for Gerbo, <laughs> John Billy Owen. Next up, you may know her from her storyboarding moments like Lilith and King eating ice cream and keeping up appearances, Ida and Rain's duet in Ida's Requiem, and of course, the cute but awkward tunnel of love scene from Knock Knock Knocking on Hootie's Door. We have our season one and season two storyboard artist, Kat Harmon Mitchell. And then next up, we have the one who is tasked with guiding our artists to make things like demons, graveyards, bones, <laughs> blood and guts look like beautiful works of art. We have our season three art director, Andy Gardner Flexner. Yeah. And speaking of bones and guts, we have one of the artists who kind of built the overall world and feel of the Boiling Isles and is also the one who designed the Owl House uh, posters. Uh, yeah. So the guy who had to figure out a million ways to draw a tele uh, Titan skeleton, we have Sam Bosma. Yeah. This table's so long, I have to like <laughs> look and see where everybody is in order. And so from abomination magic to plan magic, to the collector, to skeletal hooties, we have the one who has to color all of the magic and characters in the Boiling Isles. We have our color lead, Sean Response. <laughs> and then of course, our beloved hero, our beloved <laughs> courageous weirdo with a heart of gold. We have the voice of Luz Noceta, Nikki Robles. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, good, Sissy's there. <laughs> From the Emperor's Coven to the Bad Girl Coven, we have everyone's favorite bad girl historian, the voice of Lilith Clawthorne, Sissy Jones. <laughs> and then last but certainly not least, she is hated as much as she is feared as Hexide <laughs> Rugby Team Captain. But she also works behind the scenes to bring the best out in our voice actors. We have the voice of Basha and also the show's dialogue director, Eden Regal. <laughs> that was like the first 10 minutes of just me introducing everybody. <laughs> I, I know, that's the panel, guys. Thanks for coming. Uh, so, guys. Our first special is out for season three, thanks to them. Um, uh, super exciting stuff. We've been working on this for such a long time, so I just kind of wanted everyone to like talk about their favorite moments from the episode. We can either popcorn around or we could just go down the line. <laughs> Whatever you want. Yeah, okay. Well, I uh, personally really love 
the Tom animation at the graveyard. Yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness. The way that I flipped when Dana was like, hey, you want to see something cool? And I was like, yeah, what's up, Dana? Yeah. What you got? And then she showed me that and I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> what? It was intense and I loved it and all the color palettes and everything just came together. The atmosphere was delicious. Um, so yeah, the graveyard. Love that. We love that. Whoever wants to go next, please. <laughs> Sorry, playing musical microphones. <laughs> so I got to be more of a fan for season three, as you guys know, so I got to watch it and really like revel in it. But um, my, my favorite moment's more of a lighthearted moment where we get to see uh, Hunter and Gus like um, <clears throat> talk about the new science fiction. What's the, mm -hmm. what specifically, what's it called again? The Cosmic Frontier. Cosmic Frontier! <laughs> oh my gosh, so I'm a big Star Trek nerd, and like Mike, who boarded the scene, he was super wonderful. He was like, look what I got to do. And I was like, oh, it's the Star Trek references. So it's so cute as a Star Trek nerd and as, you know, with uh, Owl House, just seeing Hunter get to like geek out and be like a teenager. It was just really cute. And that's like one of my favorite moments of the. It is good. It's super, super that's sweet. <laughs> Uh, season three and 301 uh, was the start of um, the start of work for a lot of new people on Owl House. We had a lot of new designers, a lot of new, um, you know, boarders, writers. I, I feel like everyone got to uh, experience the characters in the new context, like very fresh. It was, I mean, it's really fun to see them in the human realm in general because we've grown to sort of love them in the demon world and doing all their all their regular stuff, and so. Being able to kind of share that with a bunch of new people was, I don't know, felt really special. Um, yeah, I was gonna say my favorite moment is also the Cosmic Frontier stuff yeah. because <laughs> I'm also a huge Star Trek dork. Um, but uh, other than that, just the uh, exploration of us getting to see the kids like running around the world, having like when they're in the um, little magic shop, all that stuff. I love those little moments, they're really nice. My favorite was when Hunter uh, meets is like bowing or oh, yeah, yeah. and he's he crawls up on his knees um, on his sleeping bag. That just felt so uh, like yeah, that's like what you have to do on a sleeping bag for some reason. <laughs> uh, and that's the kind of thing that I don't know. I don't know who added that, but it's just like I always love those details. There are so many of them, and they just seem they make the show seem very the characters seem very real. Uh, and then I just liked. I just liked the whole vibe because it was more, it was the first time that we got to do something long so it's like, you, it can be more slow burny. That they don't need to know, like usually you have to, like you have a problem, the characters have a problem and they immediate, almost immediately have to know what to do. But this time it's more like, oh my God, there's like, how, how are we gonna do this? There's no way we can do this. And um, so just, just seeing them have to deal with that and, and having a kind of spooky slow burn vibe was, was my favorite part. I was good with that. I felt like we covered so much. Uh, <laughs> I really liked the montage. I, um, I'm not normally a fan of a montage. I feel like a lot of times I'm like, you're just trying to pass time. Like, <laughs> uh, give me it all. But it was, I couldn't believe how much happened and how grateful I was because we got to cover so much so fast and every moment was really special and without the words. So I don't know. I thought that was very powerful. Yeah, I mean, Lumity Studios presents. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Um, I, I love that we got to see like why giraffes were banished. I was like, yes, there it is. That's why. Um, I loved High and By, and um, and the montage was was incredible. Um, I really liked learning that Camila is a secret nerd. <laughs> <laughs> that was a cool turn for her. That was really, really neat. I do want to give a special shout out to uh, Amelia Lawrence, who directed the first half of the special, and Haley Wong, who boarded pretty much the entirety of that montage sequence. So thank them. They did an incredible job with that. Yeah. Um, so thanks to them was obviously a really big episode because it was over 44 minutes is what was our like total runtime was like 46 or something like that. A little over. A little over. Um, 
So obviously, you know, taking on something that big, it had challenges, but it was also very, very rewarding. So for working on an episode like Thanks to Them and season three as a whole, which is just like an entirely new ballpark for us, like what was the most rewarding aspect of that for you? And then Kat, since you were on seasons one and two during your time on the show. I can go first again. <laughs> Uh, so this is my first time doing art direction officially yeah. on paper. Uh, <laughs> um, and I think one of the most rewarding parts of even working on season three was figuring out a way to tell this story and still giving everyone that satisfaction that we really wanted from a full season. So I wanted to make sure to go above and beyond with the art team and hire such amazing and unique people to help tell this story, and uh, I think we succeeded. Uh, the colors and the designs and everything are terrific, and I'm really excited for y'all to see the next episodes, because oh my gosh, <laughs> oh my gosh, you're in for a treat. Yes, indeed. Um, but yeah, that would be my, my favorite. It's just gathering the design team and leading the charge to an amazing looking episode one of season three. Yeah, I think piggybacking off of what Andy was talking about, knowing that this was like the last time that we were gonna be drawing certain things. Oh, yeah. um, a lot of, I mean, it's, it's sad in a lot of ways, but at the same time, when you're designing locations or designing anything, knowing that you're gonna have to draw them again, <laughs> uh, you sort of subconsciously like economize things in a way, like knowing, okay, I need to know what these shapes are. I need to know everything about this building, but knowing that this is the last time, it kind of let you be like, all right, let's go. <laughs> I'm never gonna have to draw this again, just one time and we're out. Like, you know, it gives you sort of the impetus to kind of just like leave it all out there. Um, yeah. Oh, oh no. Uh, also going off of that, uh, this was my first uh, job as design lead. Um, so it was, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, but yeah, it was really cool, and we, I thanks to Andy's guidance, we really uh, did a lot more like palettes. We went all out with shifting colors and doing rims, and it was it was really it was a lot of work. But it like the the finished product speaks for itself, and it looked great. Yeah. I like how we were like looking at the table. Just yeah. like, Do you want to say anything? Do you want to say anything? Yeah. Um, so I actually got to be on the show really early on. I was on the first episode, I got to be on the pilot um, back when it was in development. Um, and just, I, it, it's really kind of hard to, you know, it's, it's a lot of time and it was my second big show. So I, I learned a lot while I was on it. And I just, I really think one of the coolest parts and one of the most rewarding parts about being on a show like Battle House is kind of the range of what we got to push like thematically and in our boards. I mean. I don't know, there's really not a lot out there that's like that, and I, I got to do like really dramatic moments, I got to do flirty moments, I, it, it's, you know, it, it's so cool, and I look back at a, and, and while you're in it, you're, you're not really aware of how cool it is, because you're like, oh gosh, I, gotta, I have a pitch, I have a deadline, and then I get to look back at stuff, and I'm like, that was cool. <laughs> like that was really neat that we got to do this and so yeah I, I love all the character relationships and that's my favorite stuff to board is getting to put two characters into a room and like what's what's their relationship you know what's their how do they feel about each other and we got to explore that in so many different ways on the show so and it made me grow as an artist I, I got to really get in the headspace of characters because of Jaybo and all the writers hard work on the script so yeah for me, that, that, just working with the characters. For me, um, it was basically season three, we finally got to do, um, we finally had to tackle these questions that I had always been really interested in and Dana had always been really interested in or just like troubled by almost like when you read other books, you know, Narnia or um, The Golden Compass and you're kind of like, you just, it's like, yeah. <laughs> you just, um, I mean, first you're totally transported to the world and that's like the most fun thing is being sort of enmeshed in it. But then the next thing is like, you're like, okay, what would this actually be like? 
what would it actually be like if this happened to me? Um, and so we were always wondering, what is Luce going to do? How is Luce going to talk to her mom about this? How is Luce, if Luce goes back, what is she going to actually do? And I think it's hilarious that she has to go to school, but also, like, totally true. Like, you're, it's just like, it's almost like, um, yeah, it's like a normal, you're expected to, to do so many weird things in high school, and it's, it, it totally seems like, yeah, okay, yeah, I also have to deal with this, oh my god, and I have homework. It's just like, so overwhelming. Um, but so, yeah, so we finally got to, we had just been wondering about this stuff for forever, and we finally got to actually think about it and, and do it, and that was, that was very, very fun. But just one, just one. Uh, thinking of, I don't know, this is a lot of the answers, um, but it's super, super exciting to see kind of, this has been like, yeah, kind, kind of like what Jabo said, like looming, this looming decision in the human realm, this like looming encounter with her mom and figuring things out and getting back, it finally happened. So. You know, I've been trying to figure this out as a character all this time, but now it's just there. So it was almost like a relief in that sense. Like, okay, let's finally do this. Like, let's see. And um, obviously, I didn't write it, but it was way better than anything I could have thought of for, for Luce. It was just like so cute and magical, even for the human realm. Oh, I wasn't in the, this episode. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Arresting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, then I'll go next. Um, so I'm the the voice director for the show. So I work with I work with all the actors in the. <laughs> um, uh, and it was really it was it was uh, lousy that Lilith wasn't there. But I <laughs> I, I have been uh, you know di you know we saw loose dropped into this strange world, which was in some ways like you know, the best thing that ever happened to her and the place that she really belongs, but then also just so different and, you know, dangerous. <laughs> um, and then, and then you know, I think all of us were like, well, it happened if it was the other way. Um, so it was really rewarding to watch the kids on the other side, like trying to navigate the human realm and, and be polite and be good guests, even though they, um, <laughs> Uh, 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 you know, have no idea what they're doing. Um, and and also everything is just so charged in this episode. Like it's all been leading up to this. There's this huge dramatic moment. Nobody knows how their family is on the other side. And, um, and everybody's going through stuff. And so for every single person in the cast, there's just, it's just like, like, ratcheted up to like the most dramatic and then there's like these moments of levity where we let it all out and like it's just it's just so cool to watch these characters at this point not knowing what they're going to do next and then like seeing them all come together and go we don't know what we're doing but we're going to try <laughs> Speaking of the characters, we got to see, you know, the, the kiddos spending their time in the human realm, and obviously we kind of got, like, scrapbooks and, like, little, like, snapshots of kind of their time there, uh, but what were some moments that just you would have enjoyed to see uh, the, the hex side kiddos doing while they were there? More dates. <laughs> More dates. <laughs> Detention. I was hoping, yeah, they would all go to school and just see them try yes! to be in like a normal school and be bored, you know, and be like, it's so safe. You're like, the lockers don't eat us here? Yeah. What? Uh, I wanted to see one of the demon kids have to go to the doctor or something. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, like, find out if demon physiology is, like, different. Like, someone breaks an arm and there's no bones in there or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's just full They're of like eyes. Country, you're made of wood. That's so weird. <laughs> I think a road trip would, like, in terms of just 
what would have been fun to do with a little more time in the human realm. Like, I do wish they had gotten to explore, like, uh, I was thinking, you know, we were thinking about um, just this road trip, you know, because you, know, you have the whole eastern seaboard, so they could either go up to, like, Maine and be trapped on, like, a, an island or something, a lighthouse-style thing, um, rowing around in boats, or they could go down to Charleston and it could be really haunted and mossy and stuff. Um, but obviously a big part of the experience of high school is, you know, driving around. So I think it would have been really fun to have them. Yeah. yeah. Just oh God, who would have driven? None yeah. of them would drive. <laughs> Hunter would drive. Hunter, Hunter can drive. Oh, no. He's good at it. Oh, no. Just put him in front of him. Yeah, I was going to say B. Maybe B could drive. Oh, oh yeah, B would drive. drive. Okay, B, B, B. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she could transform it into like an adult. It's all good. <laughs> an adult like a with a driver's license. She can just transform it into a vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would have loved to have seen them go to a Comic Con or something similar. Oh my god! Uh, yeah. Get, see more, more like Cosmic Frontier stuff. Yeah. Dig more into Camilla's nerd stuff. Camilla would have definitely went. Oh, yeah. Or what yes. is she called? Little, little, what is the Little Rich Academia one? Yeah. yeah. Which one? I can't hear you. What's Little Witch <laughs> Academia, the, the reference? What do they call it? Oh, Demon Slayer Academia? Uh, yeah. Demon Slayer yeah. Academia, yeah. yeah. The laziest thing ever. Yeah. They're like, here's two animes. Yeah. <laughs> We're also super, like, nerds and anime fans, so, like, if you see a bunch of things in the background, it was very intentional. We would be like, how do we make this more nerdy? Right. <laughs> Honestly, just them going to like a grocery store. I think would be fun. Cause you know, one of them would get stuck in one of their like freezer areas. And it's just like, I, I don't know. I think that would like blow Gus's mind. Just oh, to yeah. see an entire store of like food and things. And I don't know. I think and, like, that the would- And like conveyor belt. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So if you guys seen the credits, uh, one of the army, uh, amazing storyboard artists, uh, Don Hahn, came back uh, to do the end credit illustrations. And the cool thing is, is that our directors, uh, Bo, Bridget, and Amelia kind of did some like rough thumbs for that. And I think it was actually Bridget had the crew going to uh, the grocery store and it's like Amity and Hunter like looking suspiciously at a banana. And then like us in the back with Willow in a cart with like a bottle of mustard and they're just super stoked about it. Uh, but that was kind of one of the other fun things that we got to see is like the thumbnails that they came up with of like other little moments that we could have seen. Uh, but Don absolutely like knocked it out of the park with the, with the end credit illustrations that we got. Did anyone else have some moments? I, the show's perfect the way it is, but um, uh, wouldn't it be fun if King came over and like became a YouTube star, star or something like that? <laughs> King could have some fun. Or like became the king of his own country. Yes, or became, uh, or became actual <laughs> king, or like, um, yeah. Be like a very baby title, like <laughs> weird like skull dog but. yelled at us. You won't believe what happens next. Um, so obviously we love working on the show. Like this show's just like, kind of like yes. once in the lifetime kind of opportunities yeah. to work on. Um, and I know a lot of people in the audience and people who watch the show want to kind of know like, how does animation work? <laughs> how do you do your jobs and all that stuff? So I thought it'd be kind of nice if we went down the line, this was very intentional, the order that we sat in, <laughs> yeah. to kind of take you through like the production pipeline of how an episode is made and kind of like what everybody does at each stage of the process. But instead of taking like a year to make an episode, it will be a couple minutes. Um, you will be quizzed at the end, so be prepared for that. Um, okay, so the first, I, in terms of writing, let's think. Um, I mean, the first thing is you just brainstorm a ton of, you get together, you brainstorm a ton of ideas, um, and then you just, sometimes you know what you want to do, sometimes you're like, we have to do a story where, um, you know, that we'll get loose to this place. Other times you're just like, okay, we literally, we don't have any episode here. We just, whatever, any idea is good. Just, if you have ideas for an episode, please just, just have them. Um, yeah. Um, and so then, uh, yeah, then you just turn it, whatever it is, you know, we would, Dana would eventually decide on um, what seemed most promising to her and we would write out, you know, you go from, from from these little one sentence style premises to uh, to an outline that's like anywhere, you know, seven to 10 pages where you're trying to get, um, you're just, that's kind of where you try to see if the story is actually working, where you're trying to hit the, hit the big important beats 
while also peppering in, you know, you kind of write it in a summary style, but you're peppering in, um, you know, character dialogue and stuff. And, uh, and there are note sessions based on that. Um, a lot of times you just, the outline, you'll realize it doesn't work. This story is not gonna work, so you scrap it and you start over again. Um, and eventually, after a ton of brainstorming and talking and, um, you know, consulting with Dana and uh, having the writers read each other's stuff, then you, um, y yeah, eventually you find an outline or the schedule is like, okay, now you have to write a script like immediately. <laughs> so then it's script writing time and people usually do that solo. We had, um, obviously in this, this season, not really, but you know, you would break it up into sections where you just go off and write your own thing. Um, then you bring it all back and uh, Dana does her notes pass and um, the execs do their notes pass and then we all get together for a table read and we um, split up the parts and everything and we also come in with, we've read the script before, so we come in with ideas about how we want to punch it up. Different lines, different, um, you know, if there's anything really, by that, by that time there's usually nothing glaring um, in terms of like uh, stuff that's not working but it, you know, you're just adding layers, adding a little bit of richness and um, humor and, and so forth. Um, and it's, yeah, that's it. That's really fun. <laughs> and then. And then. <laughs> yeah. It's not over yet, trust me. It's <laughs> not over. No, it, it is not over at that point. Um, so when, when you're a boarder, it's, um, you know, the script's done. We always have like a board launch where we get into a room and it's Dana, the writers, the directors, you, and you know, we go through the script together. You know, they call out moments that feel really um, specific if there's any ideas, and then your director will divvy up the script and give you your section. And you know, this is it is kind of a um, storyboarding is really interesting because depending on your team dynamic, it can be a very solo job or it can be a very collaborative job. And you're always working with your director, your director guides you with what's the best way to kind of get your stuff from your brain to your page. Um, and, and for me, I was really blessed that I had uh, such a great team dynamic. Uh, Haley Foster was on my team for both seasons. Um, Mike was on my team for season two, as well as uh, Luce for a second there. And it was such a great, uh, it was just a great dynamic. We always go, we thumbnailed, and then if there's ever moments where we're like, wow, we, we're, we're having a tough time here, or what is, you know, is this a good way to do it? We always bounce ideas off of each other. Um, and it's fun. It, the, my favorite part is roughing stuff out and doing all of the, the really scribbly sketches and all the brainstorming. Um, that, that to me is the most creatively fulfilling. And then we would go and pitch it to Dana, the writers, our supervising director, and Dana would do her pass. Um, and you always felt really good when you got like good reactions from Dana. Like Dana, as you guys know, like I, she, she's very, what I love about working with Dana is you know when she likes something. Mm -hmm. and, and so like there was never any like, does she like it, does she not like it? Like, and when she liked something, you're like, yes, like, nailed it. <laughs> like it, it always felt really good coming out of the pitch. Um, that way. And then once uh, Dana uh, gives her notes, then we go back and do cleans. That's where we make it all pretty and whatnot. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of what we, that's what we do as board artists. And it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of reworking a lot of times, you know, very, very rarely will you get an idea down from start to finish. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> um, really where you get an idea where the, your first idea is a good idea or even like the best idea. But the great thing about boarding is it's so collaborative that, um, I don't know, it's, it's, that's my favorite part. It's everybody's working together to create the best thing. And by the time you finish a final product, it has so many touch points of everybody on it. So um, yeah, and then it moves on. Oh, and it moves on. <laughs> um, so first, I'd like to get everyone to give a big round of applause to our production team because- <laughs> production team they touch every single process every single point of this this whole pipeline they're involved um, and you know our writers or storyboard artists or designers are really focusing on one point and the production team organizes and communicates the whole picture 
to make sure everyone's on the same page. So once the storyboard is done, we have a bunch of animatics and a bunch of joke passes and just making sure it all works for time and feels like a good Owl House episode. And then eventually our production team does a lovely breakdown um, of every single asset, every single page. If it's loose in PJs, we need that. If she's then covered in mud, we need the mud. And then if there's a new background and a new angle, we need that. So um, as the art director, I'm going through and making sure everything is called out as we need it. If we need new pa uh, palettes, if we need new angles, et cetera, time of days. Um, and really just focusing on making sure we have everything called out that might need a reference, a drawing, or what have you. Um, and there's a lot of design reviews that go into that. We were all in the pandemic, uh, the panoria, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so it was very interesting working from home, but we had a lot of really fun moments where like Dana would write, draw on the screen, because we like use this program where we could just see everyone um, drawing on one uh, presentation. Uh, so we would get notes that way. And uh, it was really interesting trying to to work that way, but we made it work, you know, we're, we're doing it, we're going strong. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we'll have all the designs, we have character design, we have background design, we have prop and effect design, and then uh, eventually we also have background color and uh, uh, color design, and I'm also, obviously they'll go more in depth on um, parts of it, um, but yeah, during, after the storyboard, it gets really soaked into the design of everything and we're making sure that everything's called out and if we want to add any Easter eggs or anything that weren't in the script, that's where we can add it. And yeah, and just fleshing it out and having Dana guide us through as well to be like, that's cool, let's change that. And like, let's redraw that a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's a nice little step, but more focused on the background design. Yeah, so um, like Andy was saying, we have a, we'll get a huge long list of things we need to draw or things we need to edit or things we need to see if the overseas studio is okay with handling. Um, so yeah, the start of my job as lead BG designer is kind of going through and seeing yeah, what we need, what you know can be their problem, <laughs> what can be someone else's problem. We spent like four hours, maybe even- like, We had huge, yeah, we had huge, huge design like we breakdowns. Just go together like through the storyboard to be like, we need this, 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 and then also look in previous episodes to be like, do we have this? Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, going through the animatic and going, and then frantically like text or getting Andy on Slack and being like, Andy, first pass is like 180 backgrounds. <laughs> There's no way this is getting approved. And I was we like, can't, okay. we can't do this. We can't do this. Yeah, we can't do it, a lot of that. Um, and then just trying to find ways to be like, uh, yeah, we can yeah, go with some yeah. This, oh, this can work for here too. Mm -hmm. We'll just, you know, um, and we had three new, four, four new background designers yeah, on. Uh, and freelance, new freelance on season three. So at this point, kind of we all know what Owl House backgrounds look like. We know kind of like the baseline for detail. We know that if you're drawing this, you have you use this kind of line and that sort of thing. But communicating that to three people who are entirely new to the show, figuring out A, how to get them close to show style, B, how to figure out exactly, because they're new to me also, figure out what their strengths are as artists and where where they can really shine on the show, like, you know, make sure that, making sure that you're divvying out this huge workload of backgrounds to sort of try and align with their strengths. Absolutely, so that and we, also like talk to them and be like, what do you like to draw? Yeah, from? exactly. Is like, there anything that happened that you really wanna draw? Because we wanna give that to you. We want that passion for the right, drawing. Right, right, exactly. And, and making sure that they have the freedom. I mean, BG Design is one where it's, it doesn't usually affect the plot, but it really affects the story yes. um, as, as sort of like building out the overall world and the feeling of it and, you know, kind of what you want the, the also, environment to be. We also tweaked the backgrounds ever so slightly. We did, yeah. Andy came in and, and, and spoke with Dana and basically there's, there's kind of like a temperature check at the beginning of every season as to like, okay, what stuff are we really happy with? What mm -hmm. stuff do we want to change? Like, I don't know, yeah. so, some, some really granular stuff yeah. too, but, it, but it's important in the long run. Absolutely. Um, a couple examples, um, yeah. the background line we changed ever so slightly. Um, now it's a little bit of a thicker, mm -hmm. like a more dense line, I should say. Um, the bushes are a little bit more leafy. Yeah, it's like, um, yeah we changed our tree trunk like, <laughs> language. You know, it's like. Yeah, uh, tree trunks were feeling a little bit too paper towel roll, and now they're like a little bit more like lumpy and like more tree-esque. Right. 
I mean, part of the thing with backgrounds is that it's just so much drawing that yeah. it's um, you have to figure out what stuff you can kind of commodify and be like, okay, I'm 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 drawing each of these trees, but really what I'm doing is reaching into like my mind cabinet and just like <laughs> like paint bucketing tree 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 tree. <laughs> so you have to know like what the language is and what yeah. you can do to indicate that. Um, yeah, and then once that's all sort of figured out, I guess, <laughs> uh, it's just a lot of drawing and a lot of inventing and, uh, and then it moves on to, to color. Yeah, so um, as color lead, I spent a lot of time with Andy and um, breaking down how we were gonna handle our palettes for the episodes um, and when we could reuse those or how we could repurpose them because uh, one model of loose quickly turns into about like 15 different <laughs> models of loose in different time periods. Um, so uh, once we've kind of gone through kind of like what they do for the background, we go through the extensive list of what we need and palettes and everything. We, I will also work with Andy to develop um, the colors for those specific settings and that's kind of our base and then we'll branch out off of that when we get to the actual um, color part, which uh, we had an amazing color team this season. Um, yeah. uh, Sam, Dresden, Shauna, and Mari, amazing. Woo! Mari, love you all. Um, they did a great job, and uh, you know f uh, we get the black and white designs from uh, design, and we get the colored backgrounds uh, that have been painted, and we use those painted backgrounds in order to make sure that the characters and everything fits within the scene and that it looks right and stands out some but not too much not and you know just finding that balance uh and making it all mesh together um it's always really fun to you know take those designs that we have and see how we could even do any sort of color references uh like our Rocco's Modern Life yeah. reference in this last episode <laughs> I was a huge fan of that growing up if any so. of y'all are uh, Paper Mario fans you you oh. may have seen another reference uh in the the uh the, when they were trying on clothes. Oh, yeah. Amity's, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Amity's hat. Amity's hat. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we, we uh, take those designs, or the black and white designs, we put them into a program that's called uh, Toon Boom Harmony, uh, oh, which boy. is, <laughs> it's a lot, it's a lot, yeah. Um, it vectorizes the artwork and allows us to create a palette list so that our colors stay consistent as we um, work with our overseas studio and make sure that our colors are exactly how they should be from start to finish. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's, it's a lot. There's a yeah. lot of assets that come through and we have to color every single one. Any mm -hmm. debris, any rock, any rims on the character, we've yeah. got to figure it all out. Yeah, we have, we have a lot. Uh, and also there's like background paint and usually that happens before the color design happens, but uh, sometimes, you know, schedule's hard. Um, and, you know, if we see tears in sunset, and then we see tears in the graveyard, the tears are gonna be different colors, it's a different temperature of light, so we really have to go through and make sure all of these models are colored correctly, so that way the setting, it's all nice and harmonious. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't work on the color aspect, but I just, I really do wanna plug how much work the color uh, designers and color leads have to do yes. on on this and every show, but it's like I mean part of the part of the reality with a with a pipeline is that inevitably some problems just have to be shunted off to the next person in the pipeline and when you're at the color design uh, there's nowhere else to shunt it <laughs> yeah. so basically anything that because they have to touch every last part of this show, and that's something that most of the people in the design don't have to deal with at all, so that's, it's like a super heroic effort. Well, that's what the, the best part about writing is you're at the very beginning. Yeah, you get to make everything. <laughs> and every, every, basically every season and every episode, the production team would be like, okay, well, there needs to be some really big changes in the way that we like, in the way we write these things, and the schedule, and you need to have way fewer backgrounds, you need to be very mindful. But as soon as you start writing, you're yeah. just like, mm, nope. Like, and then and you never have to, it's not, well, sometimes it comes back to bite you, but you just, mostly you just are like, okay, see ya. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, why? There's so much to do. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> 
how long does it take you to write big skeleton? <laughs> <laughs> An awesome fight happens is the worst thing you can get as a storyboard artist. And there's a lot of those, even in my scripts, like yeah. big fight, big yeah. fight happens. We <laughs> cry, we cry when yes. you get those. Yeah, and you can't just like, these things happen and you have to visualize, okay, so the big fight for like at the graveyard and then the, the, the gate opens and everything has a rim and you really have to think about What's happening is we have like seven characters, all like Way too many, first of all. <laughs> first of all. Secondly, we have a huge background that now needs another color, seven characters that need a rim, effects that are happening. All of these have to be taken into account of. So we draw it once, but we color it 5,000 times. Okay. Um, and eventually we get the final product from overseas. And also, um, I forgot to say, we have the recording process. Um, for, did it happen uh, after Storyboard on this show? Yeah. Yeah, after Storyboard? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Just yeah. wanted to make sure. Some, some, some shows, all production pipelines are different. Um, some shows like to have the script and do the records and have the Storyboard artists go from the record, like a radio not play. <laughs> yeah, not but not, yeah, not this one, so. Andy, um, can you explain what a rim is on the Oh my gosh, yes. I have a, I've been writing, if you see me on my phone, I'm writing down questions. I'm, oh I yeah. Help my, I was trying not to interrupt you all, but Absolutely. I have like seven questions. So there's a, a rim and a shadow rim. And if there's like a bright light and you only see a sliver of like a light on a character, that's called a rim. However, uh, if there's more of a shadow on the character, like maybe the, the light's coming a little bit more like a spotlight and it casts like more of a shadow on me, that's a shadow rim. Um, and all of those need to have a design to tell the animators the volume of the character. And then all of them need a color to say these are the colors of both the highlight and the shadow for every single part of the character. Wow. It's, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. That a beautiful so nightmare. Fun. Oh yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. And also, Jean really downplayed Harmony. Harmony is a huge, <laughs> huge program. And he really took charge in leading the co color designers through this program to really help them. Because it's different if y'all worked in Photoshop. It's just like, I want this color. And then Harmony, you have to play with nodes and connect nodes together to make different blending modes and different colors and it's so it's a very intricate process and I'm very glad that we had um, our leads helping out and real quick round of applause to our leads lead background designer lead color designer uh, and Peggy is uh, was our uh, lead background painter and Peggy knocked it out of the park uh, they did all of our color scripts um, and just a lot of like the bigger backgrounds that we needed help with um, and our background paint team is fantastic and we really love and cherish their work. Uh, you can see one of our color scripts um, on the wall. Yeah. yeah, that's Peggy's work over there. Um, yeah, the color script we would sit down and really go through. It's like, okay, so I want this moment. I want these colors to kind of represent this character. So every time we start seeing these characters, these colors, the audience is going to be like, oh wait, I, I have this feeling this character is going to come up. So I really sat down with Peggy and we just like brainstorm like how to really push the colors for these uh, season three episodes. Um, I make fart noises into a microphone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Suddenly I'm like. Wow, so much goes into this. That's amazing. Thank you for explaining it. Oh my gosh, yeah, absolutely. Does that cover the... And then, yeah. Yeah, for our voice acting, yeah. We really need nope, I have three follow-up questions. I would like to... Can I seriously really fast ask them? Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, JBL, uh, let's go back to... Um, question, like, when you get notes from the execs, what are those like? Are they like... Well, this absolutely can't happen, or like mm, that was too sad. Like, or are they like, or they're like that line wasn't funny. Like, wh wh what can you give us like two general ideas oh, of like what kind okay, of notes that's you might so get? That's so interesting. Um, yeah, some of it will just be. I guess exec notes are a little different from S and P notes because we yeah. will. S and P we'll is like too SMP, violent. Yeah, take it back. and so yeah, <laughs> um, I guess exec notes sometimes. Um, you know, I think the most the. I, I, our execs were great, and um, th they, just curious. but it's still kind of you're speaking different languages in a way, mm. but 
I think the most useful thing is like, okay, if they're, they may not have the right idea about, you know, they may be calling out a section and have a totally, a really weird idea about the right way to fix it, but the fact that they're calling out the section means Says that enough. something is like off with it. And, and so you just kind of, you know, align, um, try to align yeah. Align something towards anyway. You're, you're just like from, okay, like, we got to work on this a little more. With different skill sets, yeah. so that's why I was wondering. And, yeah. th and they mainly have like you know they have questions about motivation and uh, um, you know so a lot of that is just like yeah you'll see that in the board that will be really obvious in the board like how they're feeling. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that's yeah that's mainly the exact note and then the S and P notes are the the ones that make everyone yeah. flip out and go <laughs> insane. They're like that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> this character <laughs> looks like Garfield too much. We can't have that. <laughs> um, okay, so Sam, um, my question was: you were explaining that with like new artists and onboarding like new team members, mm -hmm. part of your job is like communicating to them the style to make sure you're all on like the same page about what the show style is. Mm -hmm. How how do you describe that? Like, what do you do, or is it more like I like what you did here, but loose is like soft, or like what? Or do you come in and be like, our show is. Bleh. Well, we have, a, we have a style guide, at least, that was made uh, for season one that uh, Stephen Sugar uh, worked on, and then uh, Andy sort of elaborated on it before season three. And it's basically like, we have one single Photoshop brush mm -hmm. that we use for everything, but it's also sort of communicating really granular, weird things that, yeah. okay. a, as long as you have those, it'll read as like, oh, this is an Owl House style. Like, yeah the way that we do tree bark or something like that. You can draw the tree sort of differently, but if the bark is has that shorthand how we do it, oh, that suddenly it's close to Owl House style or close enough that it passes. Ooh. And because we because this is like a, a production pipeline, when color gets to it, then color does the Owl House sort of treatment. So even if it's not exactly right, each progressive step gets it closer to the overall kind of Look. And then by the end, so many people have worked on it. That it's been judged in yeah, place. Yeah, exactly. And one person's, cool. you know, being slightly off style, it doesn't matter nearly as much when you look at the totality of it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Rebecca, you're the captain again. I'm really sorry. I was so <laughs> I had to write them down. I had so many questions. <laughs> no, you're good. But I wanted to hear from our voice actors, the process on voice acting and being the dialogue director and all that stuff. Well, every morning I get picked up in a limo. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, what we do is, it's so dependent on everything that's come before. If we don't have a good script, you don't have good characters. If we don't have good visuals, we don't know what we're doing. I mean, it's, it's such a symbiotic, beautiful, if we don't have a good director, the performance comes across flat. Like, we are so lucky to Where work on a show like this. they ask you to do stuff that doesn't make sense, and you're like, why? When they tell you to fart why? in the microphone, and you're like, why would I? Um, Could you pretend you're eating an imaginary <laughs> banana and you're like, mm, sort of? <laughs> See what it sounds like. Can we just get a real banana? <laughs> it's like sometimes like weird, yeah, like weird things people make difficult and you're like, I could just, I have a granola bar in my bag if you really want to. <laughs> like, like, I feel like that would be better than me going like, <laughs> like <laughs> or drinking. I hate when they're like, drink. Oh, drink. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um, bur burping on demand is hard. You can yeah. get like one or two takes, but it's not easy to keep burping like that. That's a talent, a separate <laughs> talent. Anywho, that's our job. Uh, <laughs> it's tough. I, uh, I did have an audition once that asked me to burp for 10 straight seconds, and I was like, I can't. Oh, this oh I would have booked it. You should. Now you know. Send me that. I guess I'm in the wrong career. <laughs> mm, I got lots of acid reflux. Um, my question, you asked me what my job is. That was the question, right? That's yeah, talk about voice acting and like what you're, you're doing it. Right we got far away. We got far away from that. <laughs> um, okay, so I get my script. I read the pages, right? And then I, if I don't understand something, I read it again. And sometimes if I'm like, hmm, where are we supposed to be going? Then I can like read it again, or I can take some notes. But the longer you're one character, like the privilege of that is actually like, my job just gets easier. Like. The hardest part is usually establishing the character and making sure you're all on the same page. But then once you know your character, it's like, oh, of course, of course. Like, and it's, not, it's actually not super crazy hard. Like in the beginning, making your character is the hardest, but uh, Dana and Eden always made my job really easy by them being super clear on like what they needed and what was appropriate for Luz. Bye, princesses. <laughs> <laughs> 
no, wait, oh, no, and M&M, M&M too? I thought it was two Disney princesses. No, the other one was an M&M. Oh. <laughs> I stand I by my line. Bye, princess. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then in the booth, we work with uh, the lovely Eden, who s- says really nice things to me until I do my job correctly <laughs> and gives me notes. And sometimes it's like a, some jokes are like rhythmic or like musical. So even if you say the line, if you don't like, land the music of the joke, it's not funny. And so sometimes you'll try a few different things and then someone will be like, actually it's like da 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 da, and you're like, oh, it is, okay, let me just, okay. And you, so that, it's not just saying the words or acting the emotions, sometimes it's like really understanding the dynamics of a line and, and a joke and where you are in the joke. And sometimes I'll be like interacting with someone, so I'm like, okay, if Sissy already recorded, how did she do that line? Yeah because I need to know if she said it deadpan or if she was being goofy and then I'll be goofy. Um, Always goofy. That's our job. <laughs> we take care of our voices too. Well, I think the other thing where it's so important to have someone like Eden is like, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but Lilith is not in every scene. It is a crime. <laughs> Boo, j A crime against the Titan. Um, but I only get the scenes that I'm in. So I don't get to see the entire episode. I don't know what's happening throughout the whole thing. I don't know the drama that has happened. Which I just found out, I do get the whole script and I feel really fortunate (laughs) now because I was like, you must be so confused all the time. All the time, all the time. But to be able to walk into my session and know that I am in the greatest hands in Hollywood, like she, not only like, yeah. Not only can, paint the picture for me beautifully for what's yeah. happening, but also make sure I understand the moment, the context, what happened before, what has Nikki already recorded, what is, you know, I, I don't know, Matthew Reese already recorded, <laughs> and, uh, and, and we get what we need. And it's, 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 it's so easy in your hands. And I just, and that's all. And the only time we really have input is if I'm like fortunate enough, like, to not understand something, and then someone's like, no, I thought that was weird too. In there, no, and like we'll try the line a few times, and we're like, it's not landing, or this movement doesn't make sense because I just did this. That's what yeah. Otherwise, I'm just working. Well, I'm and also, I mean, I know that they said they just fart into a mic or whatever, but uh, but also they like like sometimes things don't work, and then we have to kind of work through it. And like Dana will be like, that's better. Let's do that. So I mean, it is a, a you know a bit of a collaborative process. We have boards to reference, although yeah. we don't often show, because we don't want the a- actors to be like, I'm going to do what's in the boards, but um, but we all have seen them, so we know what the idea is, and we know, we understand the context, and part of my job as voice director is to, see, they're really super highly trained and skilled performers, but all they need is information. When you're doing like a play or a TV show, yeah. you've got the props, you've got the You've got the costume, you've got the other actors to work with, you've read the whole script, you know, uh, you have all the context. And when you're in a vocal booth, it's a hermetically sealed room, you have no actors anywhere near you, you don't have the, the, you know, the, the, the scene that you're in, you don't have the costume, you aren't even the same age as your character, you know, or sometimes the same species. Um, so, all it is, is is providing clarity and context so that they can be like, oh, I get all of this. Now I can do my job and be emotionally present and, and uh, interacting in the scene. And because they don't have the other actors, either we'll, do, we'll read the scene together or if we have it uh, already recorded, we'll play them the line so that they're like not doing it completely in a vacuum and it can seem more more real. Um, so that's like, yeah, that's When you're doing Basha, like do you direct yourself? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my question. I was like, do, do you go from side to side yes! on the glass? It's horrible. To <laughs> eat. No, it's horrible. Yes, I, yes. But the answer is sometimes, I mean like sometimes if Dana's there, like then she's like, you know, Oh, that's nice. Nice. yeah. That's that's she so pretends great. to be yes. doing what they're doing. <laughs> she like, but if it's me directing me, I'm like, that's not good enough. Again, again, again. again. <laughs> Take ninety six. <laughs> um, but these guys are so insanely talented, and I can just be like, hey, what about this idea? And then they just do it and make it incredible, and I'm just like, whoa, this is you know, it's just amazing. It really elevates things. It makes things alive. 
Um, and uh, and I'm what Dana and I are trying to do is try to honor all the work that's going on either before we get in the booth or concurrently so that it still fits in with the tone of the show and what the DNA of what the show is. So that's how you make a show. <laughs> only just pre-production that's all the stuff that happens before we even get the animation back and then we go into post-production and then there's retakes and then there's ADR and it's just a whole thing so anyway cartoons take a long time um, I just want to time check from our crew we have about 15 minutes before we open it up for our audience Q&A correct I got the thumbs up all right so we're gonna kind of do like a rapid fire of a question for each of you to kind of talk a little bit about like kind of your, your career path and getting into um, your jobs. Um, we'll popcorn it around. Uh, so, Sam. All right, so as a background designer, you're kind of tasked with creating the overall look and feel of the Boiling Isles. Uh, mm -hmm. When you started on the show, did you pull from any inspirations? Um, and how did you approach creating that? And do you feel that since your time on the show, do you feel like that's changed at all over time? Uh, I think naturally it kind of changes over time. I feel like once the world of the Boiling Isles was kind of figured out, it, it, some locations kind of make themselves like without needing to really find reference or anything. But uh, initially we took a lot of inspiration from uh, like Flemish and Dutch architecture. Like we tried to avoid the kind of obvious, like we're not doing a lot of Gothic like mm -hmm. stuff. You know, first of all, it's way too detailed um, <laughs> to, to do over and over, aside from like key locations. But um, uh, one of Dana's things was she really, I mean, Hieronymus Bosch was like a big inspiration. So we looked at a lot of his paintings and how he would kind of work buildings. Um, Did you sleep? <laughs> After that? Oh, no, I'm a, I'm a horror guy. Uh, okay, yeah, Hieronymus so, yeah, no is not, not for the light of faith of heart. Yeah, and uh, so I mean, we took a lot of inspiration from like the FromSoft games too. I'm a big <laughs> Souls uh, weirdo. Um, and just anything to kind of push it uh, as far into horror as we could while still, uh, <laughs> like it still had to be kind of friendly and on brand for Disney, but uh, yeah, try to push it as far as possible. Only a few times, I mean, Dana's kind of down for kind of game for whatever we wanted to pitch. Only a few times was it like too gross, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even for Dana, where we had to, to pull things back. Um, that was Letissa, right? Yeah. The what? Letissa? I want to see, I wanna see oh, what was yeah. too gross for Dana. Letissa, <laughs> yeah, Letissa was, yeah, the hair follicle stuff <laughs> was uh, really, it was worse before, we, before it got rained back in. Um, it's still pretty gross, too. It's still really gross, what, yeah. What is? Letissa, Letissa. The, the location. Um, the, like, the police. I think it's like in the in the armpit, yeah, which is why armpit. it has the hair follicles. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really gross. But also, the, I mean, even the concept of the of the boiling Isles being on the Titan, like what that means. I think from the beginning of the show, I had the idea that like the Titan was kind of trying to like regrow itself or was trying to heal or something like that over time. So there's all these kind of like fleshy growths and teeth <laughs> and things like that. Like the Titan itself has way more bones than like a normal thing has. And my concept was just like, it was, you know, stitching itself back together in some way and it wasn't doing it in the normal like healing process. That was kind of my concept. So trying to get that through was a, a, a mixed bag, I think. But. Uh, okay. Let's who will we go to next? Hmm. We'll do you, Jabo. So you've also been on the show from the very beginning, a line which uh, and a warden. So what's it like for you working with these characters and these storylines since the very beginning and now having an episode like Thanks to Them in season three where they're a little bit older, they're growing up, and now these storylines are coming to a conclusion? I think like one of the, one of the things about basically I think the characters have always been almost entirely fully formed. Like, from the first pitch packet that I saw, I, I feel like Luce and Ida and King were just, were there already. Um, and anytime we introduce a new character, actually we didn't, Hunter was kind of the first one we introduced um, and had to really think about um, on the fly. 
But um, everyone else seemed fully formed to me, and also the goals, the places we wanted to get them uh, were fully formed, and, and we wanted, and the, the kind of like the visuals Dana even wanted to end the series with, she had very strong ideas about that. So that stuff was always there. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so it's, so it's kind of, it was like it was like amazing at first because you're just like oh yeah this is great like that's awesome like can't wait to see it but then you actually have to do it <laughs> and you have to somehow um, I don't know none of us had ever written thirty minute kind of television like this and so we didn't there was just a lot of trial and error and trying to figure out where you know we Camila we we always wanted her to see the demon realm um, and know what happened to Luce. Um, but originally, the second episode I was assigned was one where was Camilla was in the demon realm. This, was, this would have been like episode six or something um, of season one. And so there was a lot of experimentation like that because that didn't work at all. It just it made, there was like a flying ghost pirate ship. I mean, there was all this <laughs> stuff that, um, anyway, so there's so much stuff like that that has happened um, over the years where we knew where we wanted to get, but we didn't know how to get there yet. Um, and so I think that's kind of, that's, that, that's been the most interesting thing to see and the most um, kind of reward, rewarding thing is uh, feeling like, uh, you know, we got where we wanted to go. And, um, but then, and then not everything, one thing this reminded me of was, um, I hope the pitch packet does like leak someday because a lot of stuff, <laughs> there, there's stuff that's very different in that, like Emperor, um, Bellus was not the Emperor, he was uh, an advisor to Emperor Pupa who was this, uh, um, yeah, it was a, yeah, it was like a cocoon, uh, the ruling family, the ruling family, they had all been insects, and um, Bellos was keeping this insect in its cocoon, being like, I'm the only one who can understand why it, like, it screams. Um, <laughs> and it was supposed to hatch, but he was somehow going to be keeping it from not hatching, and it was the coolest idea ever, but... Um, I guess it was, it was like too complicated and weird, but it was, it was so cool. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff like that that did, that stuff did change, but you know, the normal characters were, were always there. <laughs> All right, let's hop over to Eden. Oh. Yes. Keep you on your toes. <laughs> so you're a veteran voice actress, uh, but The Owl House is your second production where you've been the dialogue director. The first being a little show you guys may have heard of it. It's called Amphibia. <laughs> what was the biggest adjustment for you from being a voice actress to being a director? And how did you approach a show like The Owl House that has its characters going through such a wide range of emotions that needed to be reflected in the performances? Okay, first of all, these questions rock. You're amazing. Um, uh, so I guess the biggest change, uh, like from being an actor to being a, a director, is just like uh, see, seeing a more broad perspective, like what the, what the scenes need, what the show needs, what, uh, how all the characters fit in. Instead of tracking one character's uh, emotional journey and arc, you track all the characters' emotional journeys and arcs and how they all fit into each other and affect each other. Um, and, uh, and then the, the best ch change difference is that I'm working with uh, incredible actors that actually do what I tell them to do instead of when they're with me. I just can't, I can't do it. Um, uh, so so it, 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 it's amazing and collaborative and so, so much fun to get to work off of these people and like, and like see them uh, uh, perform at amazing heights. They're so talented. I love them so much. They make my job so fun, and and it's just it's it, working w working with this cast uh, is incredible. Um, uh, I guess Owl House as its own beast or <laughs> Titan or whatever you would say. Um, uh, I think the the biggest challenge of Owl House is the intricate storytelling and tr and tracking uh, tr tracking what's going on because the you know it's 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 very dense. There's a there's a lot. There's a lot of lore. There's a lot to sort through, and we have to figure out exactly where each character is in this specific moment as we're working on these scenes, um, uh, and that it is so emotional. And I, working with Dana, I worked on the pilot, and immediately I was like, oh, I I get her. I want to live in her brain. She's a genius. 
Uh, and I was like, this show is super grounded. It has to be, because it's enormous. Like, they live on a skeleton, you know? <laughs> so, so, it, so I was like, okay, I get it. The vocal performances are the audience's way in. This is how they're going to, this is how we're gonna ground story in reality and make it relatable for, ed, for everyone. I think we can tell it's pretty relatable. <laughs> um, and, uh, and these incredible actors, like, like bringing the real stuff. Uh, and then also like all the funny as well. Like there's the this and then there's the this. And like sometimes we're in, we're in uh, records. The rain scene comes to mind that when Luce appeared before her mother in the, in the, in the rain um, and that incredibly emotional scene, those two women were not in the same room together <laughs> doing that scene. They did it completely separately. We played uh, the audio for each other. They clicked right into it. They're so capable and so willing to go there. So grateful. Um, so it was, uh, for this particular show, it was about uh, take, taking this huge world and making it uh, uh, directly relatable to people watching it and, 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 and super, super uh, human, uh, <laughs> something that we could all relate to, so. <laughs> We're running out of time, so we're gonna go like rapid fire. <laughs> so Kat, so you were a storyboard artist on the show for seasons one and two, but you've recently gotten a position at DTVA on another show called Haley's On It as a director. Woo! Woo! Yeah! <laughs> so what are some things that you learned from the Owl House and what has been kind of the transition like um, from coming from Owl House to being on Haley and being a director now and like what you learned on there? Well, firstly, I, I was, again, like surrounded by so many talented people and was able to soak up so much knowledge from, you know, Dana, our supervising director, Stephen Sandoval, you know, my directors, um, Stu Livingston and Amelia Lawrence, and then all of my friends <laughs> that are on it, you know. Oh. Coming for you. Ah. Um, Bo, another director on season two, and so I got to really like see how they handled episodes, you know, not just creatively, but also from um, more of like a leadership and production POV. Um, I think one of the biggest transitions for me is kind of not drawing as much. I mean, when you're in, when you're boarding, you're so in it and you're drawing every day and you're really thinking about like the characters and whatnot. And for me, being a director, it's more about making sure I'm helping my board artists have the best versions of their boards. Like it's not my job to reboard like, or, or I would just be boarding it. And so I wanna make sure that they're getting to put their artistic input into it in the same way that I know I wanted to put my artistic input it when I was boarding. And that's one of the really cool things about watching any episode is I can point out who boarded whose mm -hmm. stuff. Even, even when it's animated, I know who did what. Even just like, yeah, like even if I wasn't on that one, I can tell who did that <laughs> scene. Because everybody has their own quirks and I, uh, that energy was so there from the very beginning and that's what I've always wanted to bring as a director is being like, I wanna make sure everybody's getting to put their mark in on the show and it's the best version of what they can do, so. Andy. <laughs> so you said that Owl House was your first production as an art director but you've previously worked in production on sh uh, shows like Adventure Time and Samurai Jack a color designer on Summer Camp Island, the Mickey Mouse shorts, and a color lead on Amphibia. Uh, so, and, so working on the production side of things as well as like the uh, artistic and creative side, do you feel that that prepped you for being an art director? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Next question. No. Uh, yeah, so knowing the production pipeline, like the back of my hand, was crucial for me to getting to where I am right now. And as a color designer, you really do have to be on your toes and see continuity and touch almost every single model and look at every single background and then you could be like, oh, well that doesn't really hook up, did you mean to do that? And art director, and then the director would be like, oh my gosh, no, that needs to be changed. <laughs> um, so all of this prepped me for being where I am right now and uh, the biggest thing about being an art director is that you not only have to make decisions and get in the show creator's head to be like, would the show creator want this? Yes, they would, and this is why. 
Um, but you also have to lead a team and trust their vision and say, you know, uh, if I, maybe I would have done it this way, but the way that you did it is so unique and special and I love that. And really embracing everyone's voice and vision on the show and being able to say, that's, that's the look that we want and I'm gonna carry it through. Um, so yeah, and also helping with the post side as well. Um, but yeah, having all of the culmination of being a production coordinator assistant and also a color designer and color design lead, all of that led to me being here. And I love it. I love art directing. I love managing people. It's so much fun. And there's a lot of forms. Uh, and you don't, you don't, uh, and like, like Kat was saying, you don't really draw as much. However, uh, in the post side, my whole design team is gone, unfortunately, because they're all done pre-production, so I'm just left to do all of the post-production corrections. And sometimes that means I draw new backgrounds, paint new backgrounds, draw new things here and there. So it's a lot of work, but it's so fun and fulfilling, and this show is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Sean. Hello. You've also been on the show since very early on. Uh, so as a color designer, you have to be very versatile in coloring everything because you're getting props, effects, characters, special poses, and all that stuff. Do you feel that you've improved in your craft in any specific area? And do you have a favorite thing to color on the show? Yes. Uh, I feel like I've improved in all of it. Uh, Owl House was my first design position. Um, so th it was my first production I was ever on, sh first show I was ever on, uh, and I rose the ranks and mm -hmm. I became color lead in this third season, so, you know. <laughs> I would say that's a pretty, pretty big growth. Uh, but <laughs> in general, I love to, I mean, coloring the characters is always fun because you get to mess with their clothes and like, I love to create variants when we were doing reviews oh, and options. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So good. <laughs> it's like a uh, uh, Smash Bros. select screen. Yeah. 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 Uh, Dana would always be like, ooh, there's options. Yeah, it's like, yeah, there are. But uh, if I, my, my absolute favorite was just anything that was gross or disgusting. I just wanted to like push it as far as I could and see like what we would be allowed to do yeah. and yeah. just make it, try and, try and gross Dana out was like yeah. always, the, always the goal. <laughs> yeah. Design reviews are fun. Um, all right, uh, I know, I'm trying to see, like, who's down there. Hi! Hello! <laughs> uh, Nikki, we'll go with Nikki, we'll go Howdy. to Nikki and Chrissy. Uh, so through seasons one and two, this was kind of like the optimist among the characters, but in season three we're seeing a more hardened, pessimistic kind of loose. What was it like for you stepping into the booth and giving a voice to that side of her character? Hey. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, Okay, so much for you. Yeah, it's just we'll rock with it. I'm everything I touch makes it worse. Okay, um, it you know I think was refreshing uh, to be honest because like we were all coming out of COVID and I was not feeling sunshine and rainbows. Uh, I don't know how you all felt in quarantine, but I was not doing well. Um, and so that was like kind of nice to not have to try and not bring that part of me to the booth, um, you know, some days. It was also just very organic. Like, you have to check on your tough friends. You have to check on your happy friends because that's their disposition. It doesn't mean that they're not struggling. And so I just thought it was so important because it's very authentic. It's not that different. She cares so much about everything. And sometimes you, things don't go well. Things you care about don't go well. And so um, it was really awesome. I love, I love emo loose. I would do, <laughs> yeah, I love fight scenes. I love drama. So I would do like seven seasons of her being like <laughs> tortured, which wouldn't be entertaining. <laughs> I dig it. I dig it. Yeah. <laughs> Sissy doesn't get a question because she wasn't in 301. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so Lilith has had a big arc over the show from being kind of like the cold, calculating head of the Uppers Coven to a bad girl historian. So what was it like for you kind of seeing uh, her arc over the course, uh, course of the show and then bringing that out in your performance? Well, I had to work really, really hard to get my finger guns just right. <laughs> It's really hard to be an actor, you guys. Um, no, it's been so rewarding. Uh, I remember when I first booked Lilith 
And I met Dana at like the, the launch party or whatever. She came up to me and she was like, I hope you're ready for drama. And I was like, ooh, okay. Um, but she was like, no, seriously, you're gonna have some emotional baggage. Get ready. And she did not lie. There were no lies. Um, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, you know, it, it's always interesting to explore somebody who goes through some things. And uh, when you go through some things with your sister, um, that can complicate things that much more. But at the end of the day, family is what matters. And so being able to have that come back in such a big way. Girls, I'm talking to you. My daughters are here. I'm talking to you. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Um, is so important, and it's just been such a joy. She's such a joy. She's such a nerd. I love her. Anyway, I love her. All right. Well, thank you all. I think we can now open it up for audience Q and A. I know. Um, really quick, though, I do want to give a shout out to uh, our production team, uh, Kenzie Holmquist, our production Yay! coordinator. And our producer, Ryan Borland. Yeah. They're the ones who kind of spearheaded putting all of this together, so please give them a huge round of applause for putting this together as well as just putting the show together. Okay, so we have some pre screened online questions, but we'll also be doing audience QA, so if you have a question, just like raise your hand and I will maybe pick you, depending on how many people have questions. Uh, <laughs> there were some very popular online questions that I'll get to first that I specifically asked Dana for. Um, so I wanted to get those, just in case it was your question, that way you don't ask it twice. Uh, a popular one was, how old is V? So V was never given a specific age outside of around the same age as Luz, so let's say about 15-ish. All the kids except Hunter would be entering sophomore year of high school and Hunter would be a junior. Oh. Ooh, high school. <laughs> uh, and then one of the other questions was, how long was the time skip? And she said, the time skip was a few months. It doesn't matter how many months exactly. One more or one less wouldn't have changed how any of the kids acted in 301. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, and then also, does Luz have her palace fin? Where's the egg? The egg is in her fanny pack, part of her costume. So it's there safe. you go. It's in the fanny. Okay. We're good. So we got those out of the way. <laughs> All right, so if you have a question, raise your hand, and I will try to see in this crowd of people. Um, okay, red, long sleeve shirt with black, yes, you, hi. Writing question. I have been told to repeat the question so Twitch can understand what oh. people are saying. So hold on. So the question was, is when you're writing a show like Owl House that comes full circle, what is solidified for that? Almost, almost. You know, I think the main thing that has to be solidified, the only thing that has to be solidified, and even this can change a little bit, is you need to know exactly who the characters are. And that's obviously one of Dana's great strengths. Um, just, yeah, there, if you know, if, if you have believable characters, then you can be like, okay, what would they actually do in this situation? Because the situations always are gonna change. And there's nothing, we, um, one of the big things that I think, um, was both really hard about Owl House, but which helps make it um, what, what it is, is we threw out a ton of stuff. You just, we cycled through all sorts of ideas that didn't work, and, um, and that kind of helped us get to, get to what was, you know, what felt real, what felt, um, what felt right. Um, so every, basically, nothing, you go in with characters and, you, and you're like, you think you know what they, um, what they want to do and where they, where they uh, need to go and then, you know, everything else can change at any moment, basically. But 
but yeah, so you just do it a lot and then you get to the what really feels real. I'll go Chewbacca shirt here in the front. Um, you guys uh, talk a lot about um, uh, uh, being given some creative freedom about just how far you can go of uh, making things very weird and sometimes very disgusting. What, um, this could also be for uh, uh, the actors who read scripts, but was there anything in particular where it led us to come up either the inspiration or the design or something like that that you could look at and go, this is a little weird, we could have made it. <laughs> Okay, so for the Twitch chat, uh, the question was, since we have like a lot of gross stuff in this show, is there anything that we've seen that we're like, there's no way that's gonna make it in, and then it does? Oh, I, I know something that got cut, so I don't know if I can say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you his own No, okay. Um, I think in terms of design, there's like a lot of really memorable things of like uh, the magic circle shop. Uh, I was like, I wonder if how many like, things we can put into this and like how many references so you might see like Ness's outfit and um, I, I, it might have been hard to catch but we actually also put um, some Pokemon uh, uh, Team Magma and Aqua costumes in the boxes. Um, uh, there was, uh, I also did some post uh, retake design for season two, the end of season two. Um, and my husband really loves bunnies, and he would like come into my office and be like, are you gonna hide a bunny somewhere for me? <laughs> um, so uh, if you look really carefully, you can actually find a little bunny head somewhere in one of the backgrounds. Um, so that's super cute too. Um, but yeah, in terms of like gross stuff for design, like character design as well, we, S&P does have a trip with this show. Yeah. Um, we really had to keep a lot of things in mind and sometimes it's really silly, like this can't be this color. And I'm like, it like, like would never exist in any world. Why does it not have to be that color? So yes, we sometimes get some really interesting things of being like, oh, we have to like not do it this way. Yeah. Uh, but we make it even worse <laughs> and they love it. <laughs> Like flapjack scene. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what I was about to say. I begged them, I was like, you can't do this. I begged Dana and she was like, it's done. <laughs> yeah, weirdly, weirdly, I feel like um, early on we got way more s and notes for design until, I think, I think we kind of like broke down their, their barriers a little bit. Uh, but early on, I mean, I, I did a lot of like book titles and stuff mm -hmm. like when we were kind of fleshing out what the world was like and You know some we kind of figure out the limits of what they would allow us to do Like we couldn't do anything that had like religious connotations mm -hmm. or anything anywhere Like there was one mm -hmm. there was one book that I had in the background of one scene that was like a D&D kind of like manual But it was called advanced sinning <laughs> <laughs> Which got cut <laughs> and then, we were do, doing like doing like guts and like scary stuff was yeah. always totally fine with them for yeah. whatever reason. But I I kept trying to put Donald Duck in backgrounds. <laughs> Weirdly, like I they didn't they always caught it every single time. Which sucks. <laughs> like I would be doing like a big pile of like junk or whatever, and I would just have like a little Donald Duck head. Just like I liked the implication that Donald at some point had gotten into the demon realm, <laughs> or was from the demon realm. In, uh, but so canonically no, unfortunately. But yeah, it was always copyright stuff yeah. that they would uh, get us on. I do think on the Lucas Wallpaper BG, didn't we try to get like Hades, like from the Disney movie Hades, yeah, as like the yeah, icon, yeah, yeah. and they were like absolutely yeah. not. Absolutely. They were like remove it right now. We're like okay. It's weird. Did anyone else have any weird things cut or gross things? Yeah. I was surprised that ice cream. I was very surprised that ice cream scene because oh. uh, Lilith, Lilith was a little ice cream ham. Cat drunk. murdered that. <laughs> I didn't expect it. It was great. All right. Oh, I was gonna say that scene was fun to board. Oh yeah, you mind talking? Yeah. Yeah, that scene was really fun to board. I got to just basically be like, yeah, they're all eating ice, ice cream. cream. <laughs> that, this is what happens when you eat too much ice cream. <laughs> and I pushed it, and I was like, they're gonna, they're gonna like. I have her stumble when she like like gets up out of the chair, I ever like sway like her head. 
all that stated. I was like, this is great. And then to this day, I still can't believe we got away with Hollow Mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. All right. Hands up. All right. Hold on. Hold great on. question. Thank you. Uh, all right. Person waving in the back, black shirt. Yes, you. Oh. <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> All right, Nikki, go for it. Yeah, yeah. I got that. Uh, so Hunter, when Hunter came along, and like Lucy's by, I was like, is he a home wrecker? <laughs> uh, and nope, we're like siblings. But like when I first read the script, like I don't get the next episodes. I was like, Dana, who is this? Who does he think he is? This better not be my man. I like it. <laughs> um, I, oh, also for the Twitch chat, the question was any uh, favorite yeah. fan theories? Favorite fan theories. So um, yeah, I was with everyone on that because it was just, I was like, what, <laughs> what is this? Like, who are you? <laughs> so I'm very glad that that was not correct. Uh, I'll say it. I thought it was really funny how quickly everyone jumped onto the collector loose theory. Oh. Like all the art that came out of it, and everyone's like, it's gonna happen. What it's is gonna it? Ha Wait. The collector loose theory. I have no idea what that is. There was like this theory because, so. Context. I try not to go as deep on the internet, it can get so, scary. So Dana did like a charity stream and like one of the rewards was that she would draw a character that was gonna appear in the show and so it was like the top half of the mm. collector but the hairstyle kind of looked like Luce's. It does, yeah. And yeah. so they're like, collector's gonna possess Luce. Season finale. Uh, yeah. And like everyone hopped on this theory like immediately. The and then like we're just so like, good. the art was so good but we were just sitting there just like. <laughs> <laughs> They'll find out eventually. But I did like that one, that was a, that was a fun one. Yeah. I thought it was it was insane to me that everyone was like right about Lego Ida. I, <laughs> like, Wait, can you explain the theory? We're not privy over here. It seems like everybody does know exactly what. I said us over here, not them. They know. Well, I'll talk. I'll tell you later. I mean, there's okay. a lot of spoilers, so it's there's oh. some stuff I obviously can't say about. What Lego Ida, it, what she's going to do in the finale, what <laughs> spin-off plans for Lego Ida are. <laughs> uh, Great question. Yeah, no, thank you for your question. Um, speaking of spin-offs, actually, um, I know we would all love spin-offs to happen. Uh, a, a common question that was on Twitter and Instagram is like, what would you like to see as a, a potential spin-off for the Owl House? This could be for anybody. I want like the HGTV or like MTV Cribs of like <laughs> the Owl House. <laughs> Just I want a tour of like all the rooms because every background I'm like, what? <laughs> and what is that? What is that? What is that room even for? You know, like so I feel like I want a door to door to door to door sampling. That's what I want. That's just a one off. Maybe it's a whole series. I don't know. I want to see Lilith and all of her like historian adventures oh. around yeah. like, yeah, like mom. yeah. Okay. The, the, I just hear me out. Hear me yeah. out. A How I Met Your Mother style <laughs> flashback show of the teens and how they got to where they are. Ooh, that'd be good. Well, yeah, I would love to see uh, and make stories of Ida and Rain together in like a prequel. <laughs> That would probably be the most hyped thing to see those cuties together oh, and how they like fell in love and just the relationship between all the kids. Like, oh my gosh, that would just give me butterflies just to imagine that. That would be so cool. I want to. I would want to go deep into the past and just and explore the world more. I mean, it's a, who knows how big it is. Who knows how we saw the other side of the world once, but there's an entire world to explore out there. The Titan is just one, um, one dead thing that everybody lives on. There are obviously more, or maybe there aren't, but there's tons of stuff there. And then I think, it, yeah, so it, it would be like all unconnected character-wise, at least, you know, on the surface, it would be, the, these characters would be unconnected. Um, I would, yeah. Different characters in a different part of the world could be cool. Hootie spinoff. That's what we should have. Hootie. 
A Hootie oh, spinoff? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Hootie spinoff? Wow. Oh, just a Hootie, like a full house, but Hootie. Alex's voice would be dead if by the end Alex's vocal cords shot by the end. Uh, let's go to another internet question. Uh, what was the hardest character to write or design for? And for, for our non-character artists, like, was there a particular asset that, that was difficult to work on? Or for our voice actors, a particular line, scene, or episode? I, the one, I never give Eden a hard time because she's always right. <laughs> but I've said this before, the falling in oh, oh. what episode? Is, yeah, you heard it when he, she were oh, falling. Oh, 217, uh, yes. uh, Edge of the World. Edge of the World. Yeah. She was like, you're still falling. I was like, Eden, that was like a 30-second scream. <laughs> you're wrong. Like, no no one, they're not going to pause the show for 30 seconds. Just have me be like, ah! <laughs> like, still falling. And so I kept giving her too short. She's like, no, longer. And I was like, longer than that? No, this is like, no, it's never gonna happen. And then I saw it and I was like, oh, it's pretty far. Like, <laughs> uh, she was right. Like, I just couldn't understand. Like, I couldn't fathom. Like, she made no sense. You were falling forever. Yeah. <laughs> she was like, more, more, more. I was like, where? <laughs> so that was the hardest thing. I always found Bellos really hard to write for a few reasons because. One, he's from basically many different places. You know, he's from the human realm, but a very long time ago, he's from all these. Di he lived, has lived lots of lives in the demon realm. So, you don't, you don't have like a, a set. There's not like a set, you know, kind of not slang, but you don't exactly know. Like, should he talk like a guy from who's like a colonial guy or or what? And then it's also so much of his, um, so much of his plan, like. All his plans and his motivations are secret for the longest time, so that was hard um, to try to figure out how much can we reveal about what he wants to do and, and why he's doing it. And so that, yeah, mm. Bellos was hard. Uh, something that we changed for season three that y'all might have noticed is uh, the way that characters with glasses, their profile <laughs> looks like. So originally, <laughs> they had their glasses still circular on the side profile. And I was like, hey, Dana, can we change that? I really want to like have them like work like glasses and you would see. So, and I think a challenging part was to do that, but also not block the eyes because the eyes tell so much acting and story. So that was a really big challenge for kind of getting everyone with glasses, another design tweak to kind of push them and, and make sure I wasn't blocking the eyes with any of that. It's a glasses heavy show. <laughs> it is a very glasses heavy show, absolutely. This maybe seems really silly, but when we're boarding, one of the hardest things to uh, do is King is so much shorter than everybody. <laughs> um, so, so I came up with like the shortcut of he's like on someone's shoulder. He just like climbs things, but it's yeah, but it's so crazy because you know you want to do a nice like mid shot of everybody. You don't want to show their feet walking all the time, but then you don't see King. So yeah, that that was like, our little baby boy. Yeah, so that was one of the biggest troubles. Uh, boarding was like, how do we, how do we get King in the shot? It's, it's, it's called the, it's called the Pikachu solution. Yeah, it's the Pikachu solution. <laughs> yeah. We'll go back to an audience question. Audience. Uh, staff, Albert Staff in the back. Small flex. Ooh, the question for the Twitch chat is, what would our palismans be? Penguin. All right, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'd get like a deer or like an elk, something that has like antlers on the end so I could like stab people if I needed to. <laughs> it's like, I can do magic, it also just, it could be a weapon. I, I would probably do, uh, I don't know if I've ever seen one, a mole. Um, Ooh, they're very ugly. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, okay. I was like, if you haven't seen them, you should Google it before you yeah. decide on that. Well, I mean, <laughs> like, I haven't seen one in, as a palace bin yet. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was like, they're not cute. Don't no, know that. Not. <laughs> I definitely wasn't going to say my, my persona is a mole, so I'll, <laughs> save, I'll put that in my back pocket. Uh, they're super cute sometimes, uh, but yeah, a mole would be kind of fun. Does anyone have a moth? Any of the characters? I think I might do moth. Moth is good. 
Uh, it would be, mine would be a giant ground sloth. Um, and it would be like bat queen sized, uh, and I'd have to drag it around. It, Andy, no. Yeah, they're, they're cute. upsetting. Oh my god, like more like Paper Mario moles. Like those are so cartoon cute. Okay. Yeah, okay. They have real big moles, hands, and they can't see like me. I can barely see. Like my glasses are mandatory for me to look. So I'm like, that's a mole. <laughs> Mine would be a honey badger, because it could get things done. It could be mean when I'm like, no, don't hurt anybody. And then the honey badger would be like, yeah, whatever. Oh, man. Anybody else Anyone have Allison? ideas? I have, I don't know. I have like 11 ideas. <laughs> I have, I've thought about this a lot. Yeah. A dragon, a puppy, oh. an octopus. Yeah. Mm, I think that's all of them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't... No, I'm like, I'm like, you know, yours, yours are so good. An octopus. I have the octopus. Hell yeah. As if Dragon. they don't start, you deserve better. Yeah. Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, I was say, I think I would be like a puffball cat, like one of those cats that's like, very the opposite of ghost, like ghost is very like all sleep, but I, I think I'd be one of those that's just like eyes. Like, it, it's just like buzz and eyes. It'd be so cute. Yeah. Mm. I love that. Playing musical microphones. It's great question. Good. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Uh, we'll throw it back to an internet question. Uh, let's see. Oh, I think this is a funny one. Anyone can chime in on this. Uh, what do you think, like, Hunter's first day at Hexide would be if, if he attended? <laughs> he would just turf out. That's all there is to say about it. I was gonna say, I definitely feel like he'd be eaten by a locker at some I was point just during the say, day. I was like, <laughs> moment one, eaten by the locker. I was gonna say shoved, and I was like, no, the locker would eat him. So, like, yeah, I feel it. he'd just shove everything in there, and there'd be like food in there, and then when he goes to get it, just gets chomped in. Yep. Yeah. Detention. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyone else for Hunter's first day of school? <laughs> he'd get lost. Should we text Zeno? I'll be like, what do you think? <laughs> what would happen? Oh! Wow. Too soon. Too soon. Uh, we'll throw it back to the audience. Okay, like five hands just shot up all at once. Uh, plaid shirt and glasses. All right, so the question is, since Camila was fleshed out a lot more, and thanks to them, uh, specifically through her dream sequence, how did we approach that to giving her such depth? I feel that's a huge question, Gabriel. Um, so I, I think it, on a practical level, we were always looking. We knew that she was a good mom, and we knew that um, she, wa she really wanted what was best for Luce, and not even in, in you know, a kind of super wrong-headed way or something. But all we, all we really knew about her in the show was that she had sent Luce um, to this camp. Uh, so that was, it was hard to reconcile those. And I think, um, and it just took a lot of thought, like, okay, wait, why would she, like, what was she actually doing then? Why, why did, how did, how did that happen? So it was very important to answer. How did it happen that she sent Luce to this thing? Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, and and then I think I think that everyone had their own you know experiences with their moms worked into whatever came out of it. And um, in the end, and I, I think we were also realizing that you know we're at kind of the the point in our lives where you know, you really do realize like that your parents are just another person who don't, they don't feel any older than you do basically. Um, and uh, 
so when we looked at her from that way, when we were just like, yeah, she's just, you know, she's not, she's not Luce's mom. She's an actual um, person who would act like a person, not just, you know, a cartoon mom or something. I think that, that kind of helped us break, break, through, um, break through on her. And a little bit on the background and the design aspect, um, there was a couple of things that I was talking with Dana and that we mutually really wanted to hit, which was that she's a hyper supportive uh, mother to Luce, and when Luce came out, she really wanted to learn about the queer and trans community. And so a lot of uh, shots in the background in her bedroom, you can see yeah. life, uh, life ain't binary, um, parenting LGBTQ, uh, kids and other things to really show that like not only does she support you one way But she's also learning more about the community and trying to be an advocate for her own daughter and all of her friends uh, and her adopted children at this point <laughs> um, Yeah, and also yeah, Give it up give it up. Yeah uh, And something else we really wanted to hit on was what she was going through uh, after Manny passed so if you look at her house, there's a lot of like incomplete things. Like the basement has like a paint swatch on the wall of like maybe we'll paint it this color or this color. A lot of things are still in boxes. Like maybe she was trying to move out of the boxes eventually, but since he passed, it kind of like a standstill in time to be like she couldn't keep going with some of these things. Like the hallway with all the pictures, there's, um, at the very end of the hallway, you can see boxes still and like a half painted hall. So it, it's very much a standstill in time of seeing what happened to her once Manny passed. Um, so we really wanted to try to give that depth to the character in the background since we didn't have too much time to tell that story. Um, so yeah, some little fun Camilla moments. Thank you for the Great question. Great question, yeah, thank you. Another audience question. So, all right, green hat. Aww. 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 Oh, what coven would we be? Ooh. I was literally thinking about this on the way, just in case we had this question. <laughs> uh, I uh, at first I was like. Oracle or like oh. construction, but then I was like, I'm a little wild personally, <laughs> so maybe I'd just be a wild witch. Uh, Ooh, all right. I feel, I know, I, I feel everyone would just say wild witch because you're like, I want all the magic. Yeah. yeah. If I had to pick, I'd probably pick like abomination or beast keeping. I feel those are probably the top two. Abomination, you just like, I want to get to the bottom of what, what, is, what is this thing that I'm making? I want to find out, like, you know, try to talk to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is it bad that I'm having it be blown up every other second? Like, I hope not, but um, maybe I'll find out if I what study if long enough. What if it's just like Titan snot? It was just yeah. Titan boogers. That's what Abomination is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I like illusions. Oh. That'd be fine. Uh, I think um, uh, Oracle uh, potions, like dual track, weirdly, those are just the ones that, uh, that speak to me. I think I'd probably go for one of the smaller covens that we see in like convention, <laughs> <laughs> like the, the tiny cat coven. I think that's a great, great coven. I would love to be in that. You have magic. to pick something. Can't be the bad girl coven. Can't be the ponytail oh, coven. We're we're bad girl coven. You uh, bad coven. But we're all bad girl coven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think plant and like beekeeping. One of those. Maybe plant. I'm really feeling plant today. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> the emperor's coven. <laughs> 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 I kid, I kid. Um, probably the beastkeeping so I could make sure all eight-legged friends stayed far, far, far <laughs> away. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bard Coven of oh. <laughs> Great question. Uh, we'll go back to an online question. Ooh. Which of the human outfits uh, were your favorite? I mean, Sean, I know you colored some of them, so you can pick which one is your favorite to color. 
Um, oh, I mean, I, I hate to keep going back to this, but the Cosmic Frontier outfits <laughs> were so fun. Like, even though, even though we knew, like, pretty much that, um, that Hunter was going to have the yellow uniform and uh, Gus was going to have the red to uh, uh, coincide with um, Deep Space Nine and Avery, and um, I also did a different, like I, I tried every main Star Trek color. I did a yellow, I did a blue, I did a red, just because I was like, yeah, this rules. I get to like explore it. It's fun. Mm -hmm. it, it was, yeah, great stuff. <laughs> I do want to say in design reviews, we do get a lot of color options. And I think it was for Gus's, one of Gus's fall outfit. I think it was the one with the dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Dana didn't know which one to pick, so she like flipped a USB drive like in the middle of the design review to pick. I'm like, Dana, that's not even like a coin. How do you flip it? So that's how we ended up getting the, the dinosaur shirt that we have in the show now is that one, the USB flip. Yeah. Hunter's wolf shirt. Oh, the, yeah. Hunter's wolf shirt is a vibe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we when we tortured one of our character designers, Matthew. Uh, he is wonderful. Round of yeah. applause for Matthew. Um, and also shout out to Lena. Thank you, Lena, for character design. Um, so we definitely went back and forth a lot with the costumes uh, that we see uh, at the second part of. 301 and we were like we had a couple of variations and we we're like okay so that was cool love that but let's get more more and then we kept on more and more and more and then eventually Matt was like I need to rest my wrist it is breaking um, please stop and then eventually we landed on the ones but those were I think my favorite just seeing everyone in their costume and also Amity's fits are so oh, yeah. good okay that's exactly I've been dying Eden was in the room when I saw them and I screamed. I was like, she looks so hot. Whoa. <laughs> that Amity sweater. Amity is like killing it and her roots growing out oh and God. she's just stunning. That um, lavender hair is perfect. Just the couple costume too, yes. I was screaming. It's the Halloween costumes for me, yeah. Yes. Great question, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Anyone else favorite costume? Costumes, Good. fashion, good? Love it. All right, we'll throw it back to the audience. Audience. Flapjack. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Objectively. I mean, I feel like he probably would have tried it at some point, right? Well, I mean, given what they presented to Camila uh -huh. uh, all together as a group, they probably, Flapjack probably tried something that was told to Flapjack that it was Flapjacks. <laughs> um, was it good, Flapjacks? I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> Debatable. I don't know if Palantins really have that much of a flavor palette, to be honest. <laughs> That's a Dana question. Yeah. So like, can Palisman taste stuff? <laughs> Thank you for your question. We'll throw it back Lovely to the audience. Question. Um, I'm seeing sun shirt in the middle. Yes, you. Dana prepped me for this. Hold on. <laughs> Hold, please. Also, the question is, what would their zodiacs be? Hold on. I will say, uh, <laughs> relating to Willow a lot, and me personally as a Virgo, I kind of feel like Willow would be a Virgo. Not canon, just say my opinion. <laughs> Hold on, I have to find it. We talk a lot. Yeah, just have a casual chat, guys. Okay, I found it. Okay. So for the astrology question, and that's literally what Dana started this response out with, just tell them that the astrological calendar that we know in the Cuban realm does not exist on the Boiling Isles. They don't even have the same number of months. It's a much more confusing system. Therefore, we cannot answer that question. <laughs> There's more. They have 13 months out of the year, 666 days in the year, and all the animals are associated with those months and or days are different kinds of worms or tube-shaped creatures. <laughs> so there you go. The worm zodiac. <laughs> Let's see. Hmm. 
We'll throw it back to an, uh, uh, an online question. Ooh, what anime would the Hexide and VB be interested in? What anime would the Hexide Squad and VB be interested in? I feel it'd just be whatever's popular. My Hero Academia, yeah. probably? Yeah. 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 I love that anime. Yes. Uh, probably Naruto. Um, I love Yu Yu Hakusho, and I take a lot of inspiration for fashion from Yu Yu Hakusho. Um, obviously, if you're not a, if you don't know that show, take it for the time that it was created. <laughs> um, some things didn't age very well, so like you know, keep that in mind. Um, so yeah, I would say probably My Hero Academia. I would yeah. say. I agree. Yeah. Gus would like one of the shows that's like about someone who gets incredibly addicted to gambling or something. <laughs> like, but they're really, they're also, they're, they're really good at gambling. They're, for some reason, if they really, really, really need to win, they can win. Uh, so it would just be something like that. It would just be like an, an amazing gambling or mahjong anime. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I think we'll probably have time for either one or two more questions from the audience. Lucy here in the front. So the question is, do we have a favorite creature or demon in the show? The fairy from episode one that she just reminded me of that's like, I will eat your I flesh. flesh. <laughs> I, I voiced that too. <laughs> well, then you'll probably do a better impersonation. Please go right ahead. It was like, I want your teeth or something. <laughs> I don't remember, but it was just your skin. Oh, your skin? Oh, no, it had all the teeth. Yeah, it, it had was all like, the teeth. I want your skin. <laughs> I mean, the hoot boy himself. Hootie. Yeah. Ow, ow! What a disgusting worm. <laughs> I like this little guy. Oh, yeah. Little owl beast. What a, what a cute little lad. The Titans. <laughs> uh, we don't see a lot of them, but I like the detention guards in oh, Hexagon. Yeah. <laughs> so upsetting. So upsetting. Yes, so upsetting. Uh, I really like Bat Queen. Um, yeah. I, uh, Isabella Rossellini, first of all, incredible <laughs> voice, but also just the idea that like she was the she was the Titans talisman at one point, yes. like not the Titan, she was just like a she was a talisman. giant. But obviously, it's like yeah, she's way too small to be the Titans talisman, but she yeah. was some giant. She was some giant's talisman, yeah. and then like lost her position or something like yeah. that, and then had to find this new one as like the caretaker. I don't know, really cool concept. And she's rich. <laughs> that's what's important <laughs> um, I think that's time for us uh, I know I, we could literally sit here all day and ask you know answer questions uh, but thank you all so much for joining us thank you to the panel Jabo, Kat, Andy, Sam, Sean, Nikki, Sissy, and Eden. Thank you for all the work that you do on the show and being here. Thank you. Thank you, all of those who are watching and Twitch Yeah, land. thank you to Twitch. Thank you, thank you for everyone on Twitch. Thank you for joining us. Um, but yeah, thank you again for joining us. Uh, enjoy the gallery. And also be sure to look out for the next two specials on Disney Channel in 2023. Thank you, guys. And thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. Woo! Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah.